Hey guys and welcome back my name is James and today we're going to be restoring this bag made in 1945 by the Swiss Army. It's a really really cool bag and uh, I'm going to be taking it completely apart, cleaning it up and rebuilding this and throughout this whole rebuild I will uh, take the time to explain to you why this bag is so special, what makes it unique and how you can clean some really good leather and keep it going for decades to come. So the person who made this, and this is one of the reasons why this is so cool, you've actually got the, so you've got 1945, which is stamped in here, 45 being the date, 1945. Uh, the Swiss logo here with the little R would have represented, I'm guessing, the, the regiment, I believe, uh, from where this saddler would have been posted. And you've got the name, so if I can read this correctly, it is H. Frey or F-R-E, or F-R-E-I, it's hard to tell really. Um, but yeah, this is why this bag is so amazing, and these bags in general were all stamped with the name of the maker of the bag, uh, which means that you've got a lot, a lot of history. Now, 1945 is the year that the Second World War ended, so presumably whoever made this bag was around during the First World War and the Second World War, and i just love to know that this bag has been through so much. These bags were made with some very, very thick, heavy cow leather, bovine leather, and they're made to some very exacting standards. And as I mentioned, this would have been a map carrying bag. So you've actually got a really cool little feature here, which is a pencil uh, carrier, which in itself isn't that remarkable, but they've added a, t a little block made out of pieces of leather here on the side against which your pencil would come and jut. Um, as you can see, it's in it's 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 yeah, it's icky, it's dirty, it's disgusting. It needs a lot of work done to it. There are some interesting tidbits about this bag, which I'm going to try and show you. The first thing I note is on this side. Yes, you've got lots of oxidation around here, but more more importantly, this strap was clearly made to go somewhere into some kind of strap here system adjustment system, and it's been cut off and modified at some point, which is. Interesting, I'd love to know what, why that was done. Um, but note that there is only one attachment here. Okay, guys, and I'm going to swivel the wrap bag around and you'll see why having just one is interesting. On the opposing side, you've got, again, lots of oxidization, what looks like uh, another homemade job here of uh, changing the system around. And you've got a second hole here. So my guess is that the original adjustment system would have been on could have been on this side. I'm not entirely sure. Maybe they just moved this, moved it round. But whatever the case may be, something was done here. I am going to rebuild it more or less as it is now, not necessarily as it was when it was made, um, because I don't really have the specs for that. It's really hard to find information for that. But yeah, that, that's one big thing that has been modified. Apart from that, I can't really see any modifications. The strap is quite interesting. However, um, it's all here, and I believe this is the original strap. And as you can see, it tapers down to a very interesting loop here. Again, I'm not entirely sure if this is the original strap, although I, from what I can guess, I think it is, because it's very similar to the other leather that's on here. So I think it is, but I'd love to know why it was built in such a weird way, or weird for me. This is not what I'm used to seeing. Anyhow, we're going to be taking this apart, and I'll try and salvage as much as I possibly can out of this and rebuild it. So the first step of this is going to be taking it apart, and it's possibly the most fun step, I have to say. Um, I, I enjoy all the steps, but taking it apart is very interesting because it really gets me, gives me a good idea of how this bag was made. So without further ado, let's start deconstructing. So this is actually quite interesting. They've added some pieces of wood here on either side. My guess is there was there would have been some kind of instrument here or tool that would have been that would slide in. I'm not entirely sure what this would have been, but it's interesting that it's only on one side. So if you guys have any idea what this might have been, I'd love to know. We're going to leave it because I like the authenticity of it. I like I like the fact it's historical the way it was made and I don't want to touch this if I can avoid it which means I'm not going to be touching these rivets I'm just going to be cleaning them out as best as possible but these are going to stay where they are 
So one thing I'm very worried about or I, I'm looking out for as I'm unbuilding this, deconstructing this, is what order of operations do I have to rebuild it afterwards? Was the side stitched on first to the back and or was the top flap stitched on first? That is a big, big issue for me as I go forwards because building it up again, if I get the order wrong, I may have to undo some of my processes to be able to redo it afterwards. So I might lose a lot of time. So taking the time now to understand what order was built, what order this was built in is really crucial here. You've got one stitch going up on the side here, obviously to create the box stitch, and you've got a second stitch going along the side here in order to attach the flap to the back of the case. The question is, was the top put on the first or not? So yeah, one indication I may have is that the stitch goes all the way up to the top here on the back, um, which probably means that the flap was attached first and then the sides. It's really quite hard to tell here. I am I might have to undo the, the flap here first before I can actually say what's going on here. But one thing to note is that there is a sort of over stitch or double stitch. There we go, you can see it just there, just here. So either the flap has been stitched on first and then you're stitching all the way up and across from the flap and then behind the flap, which would make sense to me, or the flap, last stitch of the flap goes back down again to provide some security, um, which I also quite like. Either way, I like both of those solutions. Huh. If only I could speak to someone who made things like this. Well guys, as often in my videos, I'm just going to have to get cracking and just improvise as we go and I'll let you know how this goes in the end. So I've got this off and I can just tell you already this, first of all, the quality of construction on this and the ruggedness of this is insane. I'm having a real trouble, real hard time getting around this. And it's just really strong stuff, really good hard leather. Secondly, uh, some of these stitchings were actually going to be breaking very soon just from rubbing constantly. Just here really you've got a stitch which is um, a thread which is really, really at the end of its life. Uh, despite this, it would have still held on perfectly fine and uh, I'm not worried about that at all, but it does sh show, you know, that after nearly, a, you know, 80 something years, it's been nearly 80 years, this bag has stood up amazingly well. And, and the last point I'd like to show is that this is actually riveted in, uh, which means that, and, and that rivet is only there to secure this whole thing here. Uh, which means that whatever whatever's going to happen to the thread, this is not moving. This is not going to go anywhere, and this is going to be rock solid on your belt. Um, I am going to rivet it again, not because it's needed, but because it was there originally, so I'm going to rivet it again. Uh, these were, I believe, aluminium rivets. I don't have aluminium rivets. They're really tough to find, really hard to work with. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to have simple double capped rivets here and hopefully that will do. Um, hopefully my rivets are long enough because it's quite thick leather. Um, but yeah, just wanted to point that out to you guys. That is delicious. Yummy. In all fairness, that is a gorgeous color. <laughs> um, yeah, we're going to be cleaning this up.
Now that all the pieces have been unstitched and taken apart, the next step in this process is, to go, is going to be giving them a very good sturdy brush down with a hard bristled brush, just to get rid of any excess grime and stuff and things that might be on the surface. This doesn't have to be a very long brush down because anyway we'll be using alcohol in the next step to be able to clean it, but at least this gets rid of a lot of the dust potentially that might be on the surface and the small residues that would come off easily. Uh, this will help a lot then uh, basically prepare the surface for the next step of the cleaning. Since we'll be using alcohol, I want to make sure I'm protecting my hands because this is uh, not nice for skin, it's a bit aggressive. So yeah, make sure you're wearing good rubber gloves or latex gloves. For this next step, I'm actually going to be using Ethanol Absolute, uh, so it's really strong alcohol, so be careful when using this. It will dry out the leather, so you don't want to use too much. The idea really is to try and get off as much of the muck and crud that's left over from the years and years of use. If you're doing this, try and do it in a well-ventilated area. These fumes do get quite, you know, aggressive and are not nice. So, as always, I like to start with the back of my project, and I'm always going to have a small area which is going to be hidden here, and these are going to be my first test areas, just to make sure, as always, that this leather reacts the, the way I expect it to with this product. Um, I'm not expecting it to react any differently to previous tests and previous leathers like this, but you never know. The idea here is not to rub too much on, it's just to rub a bit, let it soak in, and then come back on with a, another cloth and a bit more alcohol maybe if needed, just to get rid of anything that might be clinging to the surface and wipe it off. Already we can definitely see how dry this leather is getting on the surface with this product, so as I mentioned, be don't don't you know be very careful not to put too much on it you do want to have enough to be able to take off as i mentioned all the disgusting stuff that might be left from the years and years of use i'm going to switch to a slightly harder cloth here hopefully that will help me get more if you can only use cotton cloths on this kind of thing that really does help a lot especially because you can then clean the cloths and use them again later so i'm going to switch from this paper towel or just tissue paper to something a bit more substantial to be able to rub off the excess from the surface Now the nice thing is, as you can see, is that the lettering that wasn't very clear originally is now very clear, and it is definitely H Frey, F-R-E-I, and I uh, couldn't really tell if that was an I or if that was a blemish in the leather at first, but at least clearing it up is nice because it gives me a proper look at what's underneath all this. That is properly disgusting. Um, I am very, actually very surprised at just how much is coming off on this. Um, so I'll keep doing this until until it goes pretty much this color. This color means it's more or less ready for me. Um, there are areas where I could probably go a bit more, like this one here. Um, but this is the color I'm looking for, really. Um, although I don't want to do it too much just in case I, I hurt the leather and dry the leather out too much. But yeah, this is what I'm looking for. So at this point I have to repeat this process, cleaning out the two straps, uh, cleaning out the front flap or the top flap, as well as cleaning out the two sides, the sort of flap attachment system and fold system. We've got the front attachment mechanism for the closing mechanism, which goes on the front of the bag. We've got the two back strap holders or belt loops or whatever you want to call these. You've got the uh, attachment mechanism that goes onto the flap. You've got the Oh yeah, so this is also the keeper for the front little attachment mechanism. It goes yeah together. Uh, this is for the side attachment, and this is the pen holder. So the idea here is to just as you've seen me do a second ago with the body of the bag to clean these all up, and uh, I'll do this off camera. 
and get back to you once it's all done. I've gone ahead and cleaned up all my pieces using the alcohol and it's given me an opportunity as well to notice where there might be leftover pieces of thread and get rid of those. Uh, it comes to the point where I'm going to be using saddle soap now to clean and nourish the leather. So saddle soap is just a bar of soap. This one's actually quite old and basically nearly finished. The idea is just to add a bit of water and with a soft medium bristled brush go ahead and uh, build up a sort of lathe. There we go. Lather. Not too sure how to pronounce that. Make sure you keep a cloth nearby. Uh, always a squirty bottle of water and go ahead and apply a good amount directly to the leather. Um, as I mentioned, this is going to do things. First of all, it's going to help clean the surface of leather once more, and it's going to start oiling and nourishing that leather again. Don't worry about getting messy at this point, uh, it won't do any lasting damage or marks to the leather. So just go ahead and make sure your leather's nicely cleaned up. You don't want to get it too wet either, because otherwise it's going to take ages to dry. It's not a big issue if your leather gets wet, although in my case, because I do have uh, wooden reinforcements inside, I do want to be slightly careful about those, because I'm not really sure how those might react if they get wet. So yeah, just go ahead and apply liberally. You don't want it, as I said, to be too wet, but you do want it to be wet enough that it will help be absorbed into the leather and nourish the leather properly. There we go. Uh, I'm going to be doing the inside as well because I know that it works well for what I want to do and it helps clean out again the inside. Um, but depending on the type of leather you've got, you may or may not want to do that, completely up to you, and you have to test it. Always test, test, test before you do anything else. Um, once you let it dry for a bit, a few minutes, just take your rag and wipe off any excess soap like that. And you can see, wow, you can see just how dirty that was. That is quite something. Um, yeah, the soap really does help get rid of any excess dirt here on top of the surface of the leather. And uh, so once it's dried for a couple of minutes, wipe off any excess, get rid of all the dirt. If need to uh, re redo this operation, then fine, just do it again. Uh, do the same thing over again. That would always, it's ne never a big issue. Just make sure you don't get your leather too wet. And once that's dry, that's done, and it's been cleaned off with a just soft rag, make sure you just leave it to dry overnight before coming back for the next step. I've left the bag to dry for a couple of days now, so it really, it, it shows, you know, it's, it's clean, but it's still got some traces of that saddle soap. And uh, this is the part which I love most, which is going to be re-nourishing this bag. But first of all, uh, I'm going to be giving it a good brush down, get rid of all the leftover bits and pieces that might be on the surface, especially all the neat foot, or sorry, the, the soap, which is in the, the stitching and uh, yeah, all the little bits and pieces that uh, may still be clinging onto this. So we'll give this a vigorous brush down and give each piece a vigorous brush down. Try and get rid of as, as much of that soap as possible and you can certainly see it in areas like this. As you can see, the soap has built up in some areas and brushing it down is gonna basically open that up. So I'm just gonna show you briefly, very quickly with this piece, what it will look like. Well, you really don't need much. Uh, that's already a huge difference, uh, just to show that you don't need much work to be able to get rid of the excess here. Um, I'm going to carry on doing that, but uh, yeah, overall that's what you want to do for all the pieces, and already this is looking much better. So the soap has nourished it a bit, but the next step is going to be crucial in getting oils and waxes back into this leather.
my pieces are theoretically clean right now, but I am going to give my, my main bag pieces uh, a very quick alcohol clean one more time, just to make sure that there is nothing on the surface that is going to impede the next step of this process. Unsurprisingly, there is still some dirt coming off of this. This is, yeah, to be expected, I suppose. Uh, it's still, it's still got what we would call a lot of patina. Uh, let's just say, yeah, let's call it patina to stay, uh, to be, to be kind and generous to this uh, lovely item. Um, and that's to be normal. That's to be expected. Uh, so I'm not too worried about this. So I'm just going to finish up every little piece that I am worried about or that I want to get cleaned up thoroughly, and then we'll get to the next step. Guys, did I mention that this next step is my favourite step? Eh, maybe, maybe not. Anyhow, this is it. It is using Saphir Renovateur, Renovateur, as we'd say in French, uh, on the leather. Now, this is a wonderful cream that brings back some of, at least in my experience, that has brought back some of the worst dried out leather back to life. And uh, I love it because it's got some really nice nourishing cream as well as a touch of uh, solvent to help that cream absorb and to help uh, you know get the, those waxes in and a touch of wax which helps give it a nice coat a nice shine and I've often finished off leathers even brand new vegetable tanned leather which doesn't technically need this I've often finished up using this product because I find it just gives you a really nice gorgeous looking sheen um, if you don't have any of this stuff and you're doing leather work get some it will and, and test it out again a, a small amount goes a really long way and you may find that this does miracles on your piece of leather. And I'm just going to show you what I mean by that. Now, I am wearing gloves. You could use these, uh, this product with your fingers. It's not tremendously harmful. Uh, I wouldn't recommend doing it repeatedly, though. Um, but if you don't have gloves, don't worry. This is not that bad of a product. So you should be fine if you're using it on a regular basis. Always wear gloves. Always look, wear gloves just for security's sake. You could apply it with your fingers, just as you could apply it with a rag. I like to apply it with my fingers because I believe that the heat from my fingers uh, helps the waxes be absorbed into the leather and it also just means I get, I get a nice feel for it and uh, I just love the smell of this stuff, it smells amazing. Um, if you've never used this you wouldn't know. If you don't have access to Saphir Renovateur, don't worry, you can also use Neetzut Oil which is a much more readily available product. Any proper uh, horse riding shop or just uh, leather workshop will have loads of neat oils for you to, to choose from. Um, it's a great product that is that comes directly from cows, and I believe it's part of the hoof of the the hoof of the cow or the uh, oils present in the legs. I've read two different versions of that online, so choose whichever one you think is most uh, appropriate. But basically, it's a very heavy oil, a very dense oil. This is great theoretically for keeping their legs warm in winter and in our case our use scenario it will be amazing at giving those leathers a much needed coat of oils of natural oils that will help make the leather supple keep those fibers supple avoid them from cracking avoid them from breaking and keep your leather lasting for decades to come as you can see i'm doing the inside here and i believe that since these are very thick leathers and i don't think they've had much uh, tender love and care in the last few years. Um, I think that since it's a very thick leather for the oils to properly be absorbed it's not such a bad idea to do both sides. Uh, of course you don't want to do too much because then the leather will become could become rancid if you put on too much oil so be very careful about that. Also avoid at all cost cooking oils because they will go rancid um, especially if you use uh, as much as I'm using here. There you go guys, not perfect, but uh, it'll do for now. I mean, I'm 
quite happy with the way it turned out. Now, yes, it would have been much easier just to have some new ha hardware uh, of the same sort of size and stuff, but um, this is the stuff from 1945. I don't want to replace this. I want to use exactly this. I want to make sure it's uh, looking as clean and as new as possible for the next n new owner of this bag. And I want to make sure that as much as possible I am using the pieces from 1945. So for example, some of the rivets on the bag, which I will not be able to replace, I prefer not trying to replace them. I mean, I don't have anything that's similar, so I don't even want to try. And those rivets that I have to replace, well, then I just have to replace them. But as far as I'm concerned, if I can recuperate something, clean it up and use it again, then that's a win. This next one is going to be a bit more complicated to clean up because I'm not sure if that's uh, supposed to be dark or if it's supposed to be silver. I think it's supposed to be silver because I can see some silver beneath it. Um, so it's, this one, however, I think was supposed to be black. I think these are supposed to be black. But I'm going to clean them up and presumably my guess is the black is going to disappear and be rubbed off in the process. Um, not a big deal if it is. I know it would change the aesthetics compared to what it would have looked like back in 1945, but I'm just going to go and try and clean these up anyway and see how they turn out. Okay, so are they perfect? No, but I am very satisfied with the result. I was able to bring them back to uh, more lo more normal looking steel. Um, so it wasn't painted black or anything like that. Um, it was just dirty from basically 80 years of uh, being alive, I suppose. Interestingly enough, this small one was in way better condition than these ones. Possibly different material. It does look like a slightly different uh, quality steel. I would say that this, oh, I've got no idea, I'm not good of steel, so I'm not going to say whatever, um, I'm not going to say something that's wrong, but I am going to say that this one looks sl very slightly more yellow to the eye. Anyhow, I think they're basically different kinds of steels, which is why these ones became darker of time, whereas this one stayed relatively silver colour. Um, so yeah, quite happy to how these uh, turned out. Guys, I'm pleased to report that the bag is now clean, ready to be put back together. So uh, just as a quick recap, I've cleaned up the surfaces using alcohol, then I have basically nourished it using Saphir Renovateur, uh, which is a great cream. As you can see, it brought back a lot of those natural oils back into the leather and also gave it a bit of wax to protect it. And uh, yeah, this leather is looking really nice and the darkness has come back, showing just how gorgeous it has become with time. And this is now ready to be put back together. The first thing I'm going to be stitching to get a good hand or a good grip on how this is going to work out for me, especially the box stitch which I've never done uh, and which is quite particular on this bag, is going to be doing the flap with the pen holder and the closing mechanism. And for all my stitching throughout this whole build, I'm going to be using Maisie M60 MS006 thread. This is a premium linen thread in 0.6 millimeters diameter and uh, the MS006 is references this cream color which I think will look really quite stunning, stunning against the bag. It's much thinner than the original thread that would have been used on this but um, I think this adds for a lot of character. It really, the color really pops compared to against this, this dark brown. It really does look great and because it's slightly thinner it will show the saddle stitching just that, that that much better. And I think it really works well with this type of bag. I've used it quite a lot of times before and uh, I'm looking forward to see how it's going to look on this. I always like to use beeswax to coat my threads once more. Now, in theory, this is a waxed thread already, but I find that having an extra coat of beeswax, first of all, helps make the thread nice and straight, makes it easier to stitch with, but also in theory will protect it uh, once more against the elements. So why not? Why not go ahead and, and use beeswax? It takes so little time to do and adds so much. You might as well go ahead and do it. I'm not going to show you all the stitching of this bag on camera, guys. I'm just going to show you very briefly some overviews of the bag as it's being stitched. And uh, yeah, we'll basically get back to you once the whole thing is finished and show you what it looks like before going to the next crucial steps. 
This is all as simple as following the holes that were already made for you. The difficulty being sometimes that because you've now cleaned the leather, the holes don't necessarily align as easily as you think they should. And sometimes there is a bit of guesswork as to which holes actually go where. But overall, it's an easy task. It just takes time and patience. And uh, don't worry if you get your holes mixed up and have to come back and do it again. That's happened quite a few times to me in the past, and it might happen on this build as well. The first box stitch is done, and it wasn't as hard as I imagined it would be. Uh, I was having issues on this side where I was biting into the leather a bit too much with my needles, as you might be able to tell here. Um, but overall, quite happy with the results. It's looking really good. It's uh, surprisingly sturdy. Well, I knew it would be sturdy, but as it's the first box stitch I've done, um, even though it's not really me doing it, really, I'm cheating. But still, I'm very happy with the way this is turning out. And uh, this thread is looking really nice. That contrast is quite something, especially on the front here. And uh, I am looking forward to see how this bag turns out. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and do the next few steps. And I'll catch up with you guys in a sec. The front attachment piece is on and uh, not easy getting around that keeper. I have to admit, that was a bit of a struggle, but it wasn't as hard as I expected it to be, in all honesty. The inside doesn't look amazing, but then again, as I mentioned, getting around that keeper was quite difficult and I was following the original stitch marks anyway, so I could only do so much about it. But overall, went in easier than I expected and uh, yeah, looking, looking quite nice. Cool, next step. Talk about over-engineering here. They've got two rows of stitches plus a rivet. That is insane. Uh, another two rows of stitches here, but no rivets here. And uh, yeah, this, this this pouch is going wherever who the wearer goes and is not leaving the wearer. That's, that's for certain. Uh, this is overkill as far as I'm concerned. I would understand one row of stitching and a, and a rivet or two rows of stitching with no rivets, but uh, having two rows of stitching and a rivet, wow, overkill. Now, just a side note, this is made in 1945. The later models have only two rows of stitching going through the belt loop, but what they do really cleverly is that they move the belt loop up slightly so that the second row of stitching is actually the row that you see up here, which also connects to the flap which is a very clever move as it means you only have one little stitch to do on these belt loops and the rest is done in one go. So definitely overkill. Second thing to note, I've used uh, one sided rivets, which means to say that the uh, backside looks like this. Uh, they only have one, what we call a rivet head, or uh, I, think that's, I think that's what they call it. Um, now, I would have preferred having a double capped rivet or two headed rivet, as that would mean that the inside has a nicer look. But since the original rivet would have been something like this or was something like this or closer to that, I decided to stay with something similar. Um, it wasn't exactly uh, a capped rivet they had originally. It was more like this kind of rivet here. But uh, this is the closest I've got and I wanted to keep it as close as possible to the original. I am very pleased to report that the bag is now stitched back together, finally fully assembled. The only thing missing now is going to be the straps, which I'm going to be taking care of right now. Um, so this was actually both easier and harder than I expected. There were some challenges with doing the box stitching on the sides, which I'd never done before. Um, but overall, that was really much easier than I expected, as uh, you just had to follow the different, you know, the different holes made there previously. The, the one thing I did find very challenging and this is because I got my stitching order all mixed up, was that this little piece of fabric here, of leather here, should actually have been placed on the bag first before being stitched on this. And I actually suspect that this was one of the first things I should have started with, as if you look on the inside, you can see it's actually stitched a long way down here, which means that getting the needles out through here was a bit of a challenge, uh, managed this in the end, but the order of operations in rebuilding this bag was not my, I guess, was not the proper order of operations. So just to recap, I, I did all the different, uh, these bits here, just the attachment bits first. And then I went ahead and did the sides, but probably I should have done this first and then done the rest. One thing to note is that although this leather is still very rigid, it's got lots of suppleness back into it. So you can see how I can move it around right there quite easily. And uh, I think that that's just because I brought in a lot of the oils that it was desperately needing. 
and I, yeah, you can definitely tell that this leather is old by feeling it, but boy, it's still got a lot of life left in it. Um, one thing I wanted to point out is, look at the discoloration that happens on the leather when you push it like that. Yeah, you can just about see it on camera. Um, that is normal, and that is to do with the waxes being pushed around, and you'll get that on Chromic Cell Leathers, which is a very famous leather which is saturated with waxes and greases and oils, and that's what it's happening here. It's the oils, basically. I think I, I said wax, but I meant oils. Uh, the oils in the leather are being pushed apart, and that means that you can see a discoloration when you do that. No worries. Um, if you've got that, just rub it in, and the rubbing motion will warm up the oils and get them back to where they should be and looking fabulous again. So overall, very happy with this. The next step in all of this is going to be putting the straps back together. So I'll do that right now. You may have noticed I've given this quite a few extra back stitches, and that's for two reasons. First of all, I think it just looks better with a bit more thread here. And secondly, it's an area where there'll be lots of strain, lots of stress, and it will be moving around a lot. I really don't want to give this thread any place whatsoever to unstitch or unravel. Let's go ahead and do this three more times, and then we'll be ready to rivet. Now comes the time to reattach the strap to the sides of the bag. Now originally there were some nice big like um, rivets basically. Uh, I'm not sure if those were original or added on but they were very very large. I don't really have anything that large but I do have three different options which I just want to walk you through and explain which I'm going through to use and why. The first one is the traditional like copper rivets here which are placed down and these would be the strongest and they're used with little copper washers like that and oh, let's not get these confused but basically this would be the strongest and would definitely stand the test of time um, and they're, they're what's closest to the original uh, rivets that you're seeing here although these I believe are aluminium not totally sure. I think they're aluminium because they haven't rusted or anything and I believe that the Swiss Army used a lot of aluminium in some of these rivets and very hard to find these days, at least on my side. But copper rivets I thought about quite a lot and I decided not to go with them simply because everything I've got is this silver colour and I think that this won't really look as good. Um, so going back to rivets, the ones you've seen me use are these single headed rivets here and uh, single capped rivets. The problem with these is that they're just slightly too small. As you can see, the original rivets would have been way bigger than that. I'll just drop this in for comparison. Yeah, there we go. The original rivets would have been way bigger than that, um, or at least the ones that had been placed down. I'm not sure, again, if they're the original ones, but the ones that were there when I got the bag would have been bigger. And so I'm worried that these ones are going to look a bit weird. Uh, it's going to look like they're missing something. And uh, although it would definitely be strong enough, because when you're using a good rivet press, these are going to last forever, I'm not sure these are going to be wide enough. What I do have, which is wider, only by uh, marginally wider, but still wider, are these Chicago screws. And the Chicago screws would have a double benefit. One of the first things that might want to be replaced on this bag in the upcoming decades of use, once they start wearing out, would be uh, the strap. And so by using Chicago screws, it means that whoever wants to replace the strap just has to unscrew these. Um, so not only is it looking slightly better, I think, at least this is very, very subjective. Um, I think it looks slightly better with the Chicago, Chicago screws than with the rivets. Um, but it also serves the double benefit of being able to be easily replaced uh, by anything else. So if you want, uh, if the future owner wants to have proper big rivets on this, they can definitely go to any cobbler or blacks or just... Um, basically any leather worker and get proper big rivets placed down but because I don't have those I think this is going to be the best alternative so I'm going to install these now and I'll show you the result The bag is now fully finished. I'm really happy with the way it turned out. And as always, I just love knowing that these old items can last so long. I love knowing that with the few techniques that I've learned throughout the years, I can really bring 
a piece of history like this one back to life and hopefully give it another 10, 20, if not, who knows, maybe another 80 years of life. Uh, at least that's the hope. And I love knowing that someone will be able to use this and be proud of it. Um, again, this is a Swiss bag from 1945 and it was made in Switzerland for the Swiss army. It was probably a card or what they call a Gattentasche, which would be a bag to hold maps in. And uh, the it's got some really cool little things and features to it, including inside here, this little pencil holder, which I think is really neat, but not just a pencil holder. It's also got this little stopper here. So yeah, let's go ahead and use it. For the, I've never done this. I haven't done this yet before on this bag. So this is a bit of a test, but there we go. Gorgeous. As you can see, pencil fits perfectly. I think I'll just leave it there, to be honest. I'll leave the pencil there. That's where it's supposed to be. So I'll just leave it there. Guys, if you haven't already, please do consider subscribing, leaving a comment, liking this video. These things really help me and my channel grow. And I love to hear your thoughts down below. If you've got any tips, tricks, or if you learned something or just want to share your thoughts, go ahead and leave me a message. I try to respond and reply to as many as you as possible. As always, thanks a ton for watching, guys. Thanks for joining me today. Hopefully you've learned something. Hopefully you've enjoyed this video and hopefully I'll see you very soon for some more Leathercraft.